Kabani Savage, born January 1st, 1975, was raised in the Richard Island Projects in North Philly, which was one of the toughest housing projects in the city, before moving to the Hunted Park section. He attended Frankfurt High School, but he wouldn't make it past the ninth grade. He ended up dropping out. He was heavily influenced by his father, Joe, who was already knee deep in the drug business by the time Kabani was born and his father's business partner, Bubby Thomas. By the time Kabani dropped out of ninth grade, his father was diagnosed with cancer and Bubby Thomas eventually took him in as his new partner. During this time, Savage took up the gym and had shown promise as a young boxer. He got his start working at the Front Street Gym in North Philly and later attended a boxer camp run by promoter Don King. His mother told the Philadelphia Daily News in 2004. Kabani Savage, a junior welterweight, briefly turned pro in 1997, was 15-0 as an amateur, whose best punch was a quick left jab, said his sister and fellow convicted murderer Kadada Savage. Records indicate that Savage won his only pro fight. He began his career in illegal drug trafficking around the same time in the early to mid 90s by being a block runner. Savage found that he had a knack for the hustle and was outselling his counterparts and quickly made a name for himself. Before long, he was peddling PCP by himself, selling mostly out of his mother's house on Darien Street. Before long, he was a distributor of PCP in various forms, as well as marijuana, crack, and coke. He had connections with numerous dealers who controlled drug corners in the vicinity of Erie Avenue in North Philadelphia. For a time, he was in partnership with the Erie Ave mob. By the late 1990s, Savage had come into his own. He was in control of four or five blocks, dealing in multiple kilos of coke at a time. As his sales increased, Savage began to dilute the drug and then recompress it to increase the quantity. His profit margin rose accordingly. In the early 2000s, one of Savage's main players was Eugene Twin Coleman. Coleman helped distribute to various individuals in the group and also handled proceeds from drug sales. Savage's inner circle included enforcers who carried out Savage's commands without hesitation. Among the enforcers were Kareem Bluntley and Lamont Poppy I. Lewis. Although loyal to Savage for a time, Coleman and Lewis eventually cooperated with the government prior to their respective guilty pleas in February 2004 and April 2011. Both testified at Savage's 2013 trial about the operations of the KSO and its use of violence. And that violence was often deadly. The Kobani Savage saga would quickly spiral out of control. Four federal indictments ended up coming out this story along with city officials getting caught up as well. I'll be here for hours trying to break down everything that went down in these cases. So many names, faces, and characters are involved and I literally don't have enough time to go through and explain it all. We would be here for hours, so a lot of names and elements of this tale are gonna be left out for time's sake. I think I got the most important and relevant info possible, however. What turned Kabani Savage's tale from a drug kingpin to one of the most notorious names in Philadelphia history started with a single incident that happened in March 1998. Tobias Flowers was another big name in North Philly in the 90s. Along with 8th and Pike and 9th and Pike, Flowers' main corner was the notorious 8th and Butler. Butler is a very tough corner. In March of 1998, when Savage was in the vicinity of Tobias's drug corner on 8th and Butler, a man by the name of Kenneth Lassiter, a barber from Lansdowne in town to visit a friend, accidentally bumped into Savage's car. A confrontation ensued and Savage demanded that Lassiter pay for the damage. Despite Lassiter's apology, Savage allegedly said something to the effect of, does anyone know this guy? to a couple of people, including Flowers, who was out there on that fateful March afternoon. When no one said yes, Savage pulled a gun out and shot him once. Lassiter died from the gunshot wound. Flowers witnessed the murder. 
Flowers and Savage had somewhat of an uneasy alliance and were kind of respected enemies. They sold in the same area, but they managed to keep it cordial until this incident shattered that illusion. By committing murder on Flowers' corner, authorities argued that Savage was able to shut down Flowers' drug dealing. A murder brought police, and a police presence made drug dealing impossible. Eventually, Flowers got his business back up and running, but he never forgot, and that may have been one of the reasons he agreed to testify for the DA's office against Savage, who was indicted for the Lassiter murder. Both men were from North Philadelphia. Both had been professional boxers. Flowers' decision to cooperate, while in theory a violation of the code of the street, was viewed by many as an act of revenge for what Savage had done on his corner. Flowers declined the DA's office offer for protection. He stayed on the streets, and on March 1, 2004, on that same 8th and Butler corner, he was shot 17 times. The shooting occurred just two days before Savage was to go on trial for murder. This started a pattern of witnesses and potential witnesses who worked directly for Savage disappearing. This is what the state says happened. Mansur Abdullah belonged to the Savage family, and he and Savage would supply each other with coke, according to court records. It was Savage who first taught Abdullah how to dilute and recompress it, which eventually raised the suspicion in Savage's mind that Abdullah was overcharging him years down the line. In September of 2000, Abdullah visited Savage to collect a debt. Savage paid him in cash placed in a red sneaker box. He then told Kareem bluntly to go with Abdullah back to his crib under the disguise that he was to provide protection because of the robberies that had recently taken place. Bluntly was strapped. Coleman was told to pick up Bluntly soon afterwards. When Coleman and Bluntly returned a half hour later, Bluntly handed Savage the red sneaker box with the cash still inside. Although Bluntly had carried out the instruction to shoot Abdullah, he was unsure if Abdullah was actually dead. Savage instructed Coleman to find out. Coleman followed orders and later confirmed that he saw Abdullah slumped over in his car. The car was later found set on fire with Abdullah inside. Carlton Brown was another victim of multiple gunshot wounds to the head and chest. Although Brown was a member of the Savage family, Savage suspected Brown of killing Savage's good friend, Ronald Walston. Savage instructed Lewis that he, quote, had to do it, which Lewis understood to mean he had to kill Brown. Lewis obeyed and Brown was killed. Lewis also murked Barry Parker on Savage's orders. It appeared Parker was attempting to take over Stephen Northington's drug corner, so Northington complained to Savage, his supplier, Savage replied to Northington that nobody come and take nothing. You have to handle your business. This is what we do. On February 26, 2003, at Savage's command, Lewis left Savage's house with Northington. They saw Parker at the drug corner. Lewis then shot Parker several times in the chest, effectively eliminating Northington's competition. Two days after the Parker murder, Kabani Savage was sentenced in a state court on a cocaine possession charge. He had pled guilty and got 18 months of probation. He had yet to face a jury for the murder of Kenneth Lassiter, the broad daylight killing at 8th and Butler. Clearly, Savage did not hesitate to protect his organization by getting rid of those who threatened to interfere with his network. He also had no qualms about murdering those he believed were cooperating with law enforcement. In March of 2003, Savage suspected that Tyrone Tolliver, who was Eugene Coleman's friend, was going to cooperate. When Tolliver had difficulty filling a coke order, he looked to Savage to supply him. Although Savage did not have any on hand, he agreed to help and directed Coleman to take Tolliver to Coleman's apartment where the organization regularly recompressed cocaine. Bluntly arrived at the apartment shortly thereafter. To Coleman's surprise, Bluntly shot Tolliver in the head. At Savage's direction, Bluntly and Coleman disposed of the body. In addition to the benefit of eliminating someone Savage thought was a snitch, the Tolliver murder allowed Savage to put some dirt on Coleman. Coleman knew a lot about the KSO's operations and everyone thought Coleman was weak and if he got into some trouble, he would tell. 
around this same time in a further effort to assure the loyalty of those closest to him and to stop any thoughts his allies might have of cooperating with law enforcement, Savage, along with Lewis and two other high-ranking members of the KSO, made a pact. Basically, the men agreed that if any one of them cooperated with law enforcement, quote, their mother's lives would be in danger, unquote. Although Coleman wasn't there when the deadly pact was made, Cabani made sure that Coleman learned of it. In 2004, Savage was prosecuted for Lassiter's murder. While jailed awaiting trial, Savage continued to intimidate and threaten others with retaliation if he suspected that they were working with the government. First, Savage set his sights on eyewitness Tybius Flowers, the prosecution's main witness. Savage told Lewis, who was also in jail, that he was not worried because Flowers would never make it to court. Savage made similar remarks to another prisoner, according to court papers. Savage's prophecy came true when Flowers was killed in a shower of bullets as he sat in his car outside of his aunt's house the night before trial. While there were no eyewitnesses, Northington later told a fellow prisoner of his disdain for snitches and disclosed that he had slumped Flowers and sent him to Red Heaven. Savage, too, revealed that he had played a part in Flowers' murder, advising the same fellow prisoner that he had, quote, spanked the case and would be released soon. Savage's brutal efforts paid off. Lacking Flowers' testimony, the prosecution floundered and Savage was acquitted of Lassiter's murders. He was released from Philadelphia County Prison on April 8, 2004. But within a week, federal authorities arrested him on drug trafficking and other charges. See, the original 1998 killing of Kenneth Lassiter was what originally put Cavani on the Fed's radar. And even before this trial, people began telling on the organization, and that attracted higher than usual attention from law enforcement. Even while detained, Savage continued to direct the KSO's operation from his jail cell. He was heated that Coleman, who was also in jail, was assisting the prosecution. He told anybody and everybody who would listen about Coleman. Coleman received threats from other inmates who had connection to the KSO. While in a visiting room of the prison, Coleman saw Savage's sister, Kadada Savage. She encouraged him to not, quote, let these crackers break you, unquote. Kadada later wrote to Coleman, encouraging him not to reveal anything to federal agents, closing her letter with the statement, death before dishonor to your family. Coleman understood that that was meant to threaten his personal family, not members of the KSO. Later, when Coleman was in a holding cell in the federal courthouse, Savage and one of his associates were placed in an adjacent cell. An obvious setup by the feds and Cabani took the bait, or didn't care. Immediately, Savage spoke of getting rid of rats and told Coleman that his family should die as well. By this time, Savage had instructed Kadada to have Lewis firebomb Coleman's family home in retaliation for Coleman's cooperation, which was all recorded on wiretap. Kadada Savage was a big part of the orchestrating of business while her older brother was in jail awaiting trial. She would pass on the direction and shot calls from Kabani, and people definitely carried out whatever her and her brother wanted during this time. In a telephone call from prison on the evening of October 8, 2004, Savage spoke with both Kadada and Lewis. Lewis agreed to do anything Savage ordered, even if it meant, quote, kill somebody for him. After the call concluded, Kadada relayed to Lewis the directive from Savage to firebomb the Coleman house. She instructed Lewis to torch the home late that night when everybody, including Coleman's mother and brother, would be there. Kadada drove Lewis to the block where Coleman lived and pointed out the house. She also informed him that guns and a pit bull may be inside. Lewis told Kadada that his cousin, Robert B.J. Merritt, would help him. 
Kadada promised Lewis $5,000 for doing the job. At around 4 a.m. the following morning, Lewis and B.J. Merritt took two cans filled with gasoline to Coleman's house. Lewis kicked in the door and fired his gun twice. Merritt lit and threw both cans into the house, causing an explosion. Fire then ravaged the structure, resulting in the death of all six occupants. Coleman's mother, Marcella Coleman, his infant son, Damir Jenkins, his twin brother's 15-year-old son, Sean Rodriguez, his sister, Regina Nash's 12-year-old son, Taj Porsche, his cousin, Tamika Nash, who Coleman regarded as a sister, and Tamika's 10-year-old daughter, Khadija. Acting on Kadada's instruction, Lewis called her and left a message that Savage's orders had been carried out. It was not until later that Lewis learned that four children had died in the fire. When Lewis confronted Kadada about the children in the house, Kadada responded to Lewis, quote, fuck him. Kadada paid Lewis only part of the 5,000 she had promised. Merritt received a used car and $500. Later recordings of prison conversations between Savage and others demonstrated his involvement in the Coleman firebombing. They also revealed Savage's great satisfaction that the killings had taken place. The intercepted conversations revealed plans to kill yet another witness and their families. And then he says, well, he's got to go. Why take a chance? And you say, if I was wrong, so be it. Exactly. And you're talking about killing witnesses. At the time, yes. Okay. Coleman's a drug dealer. Lamont Lewis is a murderer. You, you can, as a defense attorney, challenge those guys. But you can't cross-examine that tape. You said, them rats, they got to pay. Exactly. Savage's continued threats were troubling enough that in February 2007, the United States Attorney General authorized the Bureau of Prisons to impose special administrative measures restricting Savage's communications with others, including his family. In April of 2009, an indictment in his case was returned, naming Savage, Lamont Lewis, Robert Merritt, and Stephen Norvington as defendants. Savage was held at the Federal Detention Center in Philadelphia during his trial. Jury selection for Savage's trial occurred in September of 2012. Lamont Lewis served as a star witness testifying against Cabani and Kadada, as well as Merritt and Stephen Northington, among many others. The trial ended in a guilty verdict. Lewis was a much better witness than I think the defense anticipated. It was bone chilling at times to hear him go through specifics as to everything that he did in these murders. While describing the firebombing, the confessed murderer choked back tears over what he had done. Everybody in the courtroom knew that he was speaking the truth. In the end, it was Kabani Savage's own words that did the most damage. And then he says, well, he's got to go. Why take a chance? And you say, if I was wrong, so be it. Exactly. And you're talking about killing witnesses. Um, yes. On May 13, 2013, Savage was convicted of 12 counts of murder in aid of racketeering, as well as one count each of the following crimes. Conspiracy to commit murder in aid of racketeering, conspiracy to participate in a racketeering enterprise, and retaliating against a witness by murder. In June 2013, Savage was given 13 death sentences. The well, judge imposed 13 death sentences this morning against reputed drug pin Caboni Savage. Jurors unanimously approved the sentence for Savage last week. They had convicted the 38-year-old former boxer turned drug kingpin for the murders of 12 people, six of whom died in a firebombing he had ordered from prison. The 13th death sentence comes from a conviction for retaliating against a witness. The 2004 blaze targeted relatives of a witness who was planning to testify against Savage. The sentences were formally pronounced by Judge Richard Barclay Serrett. Savage is currently incarcerated in ADX Florence, near Florence, Colorado. In May 2013, Kadada Savage was convicted of various crimes, including retaliating against witnesses and aiding racketeering. In February 2014, the judge imposed a sentence of life imprisonment plus a consecutive 10-year sentence. The life sentence was mandatory. Kadada Savage tried to delay the sentencing, but the judge denied the request. 
Kadada is now at FCI Tallahassee. Merritt was given a life sentence at USP Terra Haupt. Lewis was given a 40-year prison sentence. Northington received a life sentence at USP Pullman. If this story doesn't steer you away from the streets, then nothing will. Here, you had a talented boxer and athlete, an extremely capable businessman. He ended up putting all his talents in the worst business choice possible, selling drugs. As you see with the story of pretty much every drug dealer, there's only three ways this ends. Death, jail, or becoming a star witness for the prosecution, which usually leads to death or jail time anyway. I don't know about you, but all three of those options sound horrible. I'm good with being out of jail and alive. Savage was a man who stuck to the rules of the street all the way to the end and caused total devastation and destruction to everyone around him, including six innocent victims, which is the most heartbreaking, callous, and unnecessary part of this story. Thanks for watching. This has been American Confidential. Until next time, be safe.